not very often, Holly. Uh, when we when we have an opportunity to talk, uh, it's usually music or we talk a lot of authors or sports. So there's something about movies that I really love because I don't necessarily know the answers to my questions. Ah, I agree. It's also like the magic of the big screen or the little screen. And there's just so much that goes on behind the scenes. So who better to talk movies and talk about uh, the Miracle Club than uh, director Thaddeus O'Sullivan, my friend. How are you? Very good. Uh, good to be talking to you. Thaddeus, we like to ask this skill testing question because we never know where it's going to go. And that is, who are you and where did you come from? <laughs> um, um, I was born in Dublin and uh, I uh, lived in Dublin City. And uh, I emigrated to uh, England, to London, when I was 18, after school. And then uh, I worked for a few years there. And then I went into higher education. I went to, uh, did graphics at art school. And then I did uh, um, film at, a, uh, at the Royal College of Art. And then I started doing shorts and uh, I work as a cinematographer. And... Um, finally uh, started to direct, um, started with shorts and then um, worked on features and then um, uh, did a lot of television, worked for a lot for the BBC. Um, so, uh, but so I've been lucky enough to uh, spend all my working life uh, in film. So um, very fortunate in that respect. Growing up in Ireland, that sounds like a, a wonderful, fantastic place. My great grandmother was actually from Ireland. Uh, so I always feel like it's, you know, a bit of a home for me, even though I've literally never been there. <laughs> One day. <laughs> One day. Okay, <laughs> it's on my bucket list. Uh, but, but growing up in Ireland, what was it that drew you to a career path of being in film? Hmm. No, I mean, uh, I came from a working class family and uh, we, all my family were tradespeople. Um, there was no sense of a uh, world outside of that, particularly. So, um, but when I was a teenager, I got interested in uh, cameras and started to take pictures and and uh, and stuff like that. And and uh, drifted away from. And then when I moved, uh, when I moved away, um, I was very glad to leave Ireland. I didn't I didn't want to be there. Uh, I wanted to be somewhere else. And um, when I moved to London, uh, was it was the 60s, so uh, everything was erupting and um, anything was possible. And um, there was a, an acceptance of uh, where you came from without there too much questioning. There's always been prejudices about Irish and working class and, and mm. all that. Somehow London in the 60s was in this wonderful bubble where you could just be anything. So in a sense, it gave me the freedom to think a bit differently and to think that uh, things were possible. Uh, I loved, and, and I can't speak for Holly, but when it came to radio, I was, there was a, I liked the idea of radio, but once I had my very first time that I was on air, I was hooked. I was like, this is the greatest job in the world. Can you pinpoint a moment to you where you're like, I like the idea of film, but then where you're like, this is exactly what I want to do with the rest of my life. Uh, yeah, when did that come? Um, I think, um, when I find it, when I made a, I mean, obviously when I went to film school, um, I felt, uh, that it was a, it was a path hmm. really. I didn't feel, uh, I knew I wanted to make films, but it was when I was on the set of my first short, I think, uh, and, uh, I was talking to actors, um, who were listening to me and, we were had an understanding of uh, of something that previously would have been quite abstract, hmm. and um, I think that's probably when it came home to me. Uh, this this really, I think I, I can do this. I think when I was at film school, um, it was uh, the work I was doing was very avant garde stuff. We were very interested in the avant garde in the sixties, and the. Yeah. And, there was a lot of uh, avant-garde filmmakers in America um, at the time and uh, who were making diary films, long uh, diary films and what we call yeah. And uh, so I was very taken up with all of that. And uh, 
But the first time I did, um, and, but it never, it kind of led nowhere. I didn't feel uh, it was me. And uh, when I, uh, as I say, it was on the set of this short film, we had two really, really wonderful actors. And um, it was uh, something that I had co-written as well. And mm. uh, I felt it was magical the way things were coming together. And the idea that actors would actually do what you suggested. <laughs> Uh, actors that you were uh, really uh, enamored of, you know, who were, one of them is Bob Hoskins, who's, uh, you know, even then he was quite famous. And um, we were very lucky to have him. And an, uh, an Irish actor called Brenda Fricker, who um, uh, got an Oscar for um, My Left Foot. Uh, so I was in good company and then um, felt, uh, I felt very good about myself, I have to say. So I think that I'd say that was that was a moment. Yeah. Bob Hoskins was interviewed in some newspaper at the time because, as I say, he was quite well known. And he said, uh, "You got this young, uh, we got this young uh, young guy, Thaddeus. He's uh, Irish. He said uh, he has a good career ahead of him." And I thought, "Wow, that's amazing!" <laughs> Whoa, stamp of approval. Stamp of approval. Yeah. And you know, we all need that, and I uh, still need it. Um, Never goes away that need. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because the older I get, I thought I'd have everything all together and I'd know what I want to do with my life. And here mm -hmm. I am, midlife, thinking, am I doing the right thing? <laughs> it's funny how that works. But I think when you have a good foundation of your life, it makes it easier to navigate some of those moments of self doubt. Well, the foundation for me, I have to say, uh, was I, I hated. Uh, the, 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 I just hated living in Ireland, really. Uh, and uh, I just needed to get out. And that, that was motivation. You know, mm -hmm. I just, you know, if, you, if you're going to leave something behind, you better make it work. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, no emigrant wants to go back home and say it didn't work. Oh. I'm yeah. I've arrived back because I failed. So, you know, once I left, I was never really... I, I, I was never going to go back. I sort of knew that. Uh, but if I ever did, I was going to be, I was going to have done something with my life that was um, useful. Not that I, films. Are I find that there's a lot of actors now who then want to step uh, from being in front of the camera to behind it. Was your thoughts of ever, I want to also be, I want to do a whole bunch of acting and directing, or was it just, no, this is where I feel like I'm led to be. No, I never, I never, felt that I always felt very shy uh imagined in that imagined role uh I wouldn't I couldn't no I didn't uh, I never thought of anything else really um mm. I started out with uh, um as a photographer uh more and then I was a cinematographer at college in the 10 years after I left college and um uh, but I've always I've always wanted to direct um and um just working as a cinematographer was more of a means to an end, really. I was getting a lot of experience working with uh, other directors and uh, being on a set and working with actors and the whole thing. Because when you're a cinematographer, you're up there at the front and you're, you know, you're making people are relying on you a lot. So it's a lot of responsibility. So that was quite a good, a good uh, training to give me a bit of confidence when I did go on my own set and was sort of in charge. So to speak. Um, um, so yeah. Um, so when when you had mentioned uh, that you started out with shorts, is there a difference when it comes to directing, doing shorts or a film or a TV series, or is it all the same whether you're doing one or the other? Uh, well, um, um, a, a short has to be um, like a short story, I guess. It, it has to have a uh, within it, uh, in this mise en scène, it's got to have uh, aspects of the story which the the pictures not necessary. The dialogue is not necessarily going to tell you, um, and but you have to lead an audience into imagining things that are not on the screen, and uh, either through the dialogue or through the mise en scène, and uh, that's really hard uh, because every everyone has to be. Uh, suggestive and not loaded, suggestive but not loaded, and um, keep, keeping an audience's uh, intrigued. Uh, 
and they're just getting enough exposition to um to stay in that interested in that world um just until it's resolved until whatever the problem is in the story is resolved um the one i made was um it was uh, it was called the woman who married clark gable it was a very funny story cut uh a strange story about um an Irish woman who marries uh, a Protestant Englishman in Dublin, and it's about how they how they get on and how they don't get on, and she has this fantasy that he's Clark Gable, hmm. and that's Bob Hoskins. And if you know Bob Hoskins, he couldn't look more like our Clark Gable than the table I'm I'm sitting at. <laughs> and she puts a moustache on him, and he says, "What's this for?" And she says. Never mind, you <laughs> you look better with it, and it turns out that she's she's fantasizing that she's living with Clark Gable. So she goes to the priest and she says, "I'm really worried about the sin I keep committing." And he says, "What's that sin?" She says, "I'm living with my husband." But and he says, "That's fine." So, but the the sin is that I'm imagining he's somebody else, and and that. So anyway, we, <laughs> it, was, it was a funny story. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, you say about that short, how you got to work with like a dream cast that you were just so excited to be with them. Uh, when I take a look at your cast for the Miracle Club, that would be like my dream crew mm -hmm. to hang out with. Maggie Smith, Kathy Bates, Laura Linney. Um, talk about the film. Why did that film and that story draw you to being a part of that project? Um, I was originally pro um, I was originally approached um, some years ago, uh, to, by HBO when they were doing it, and uh, um, it didn't work out at the time. And then years later, um, a writer I was working with uh, on a BBC project came to me and said, "I believe that you've been involved in this project in the past. I've been asked to do a rewrite." And so uh, he said, "The producer would like you to come back and get involved." So. Um, I did, and at that time, uh, Maggie Smith and Kathy Bates were already interested in it, and um, uh, and then uh, during the period that I was developing uh, the project, uh, Laura Linney came on board, and, um, and then after that, we uh, we obviously cast the rest of the, the rest of the crew. Then, so um, yes, in answer to your question, uh, they were extraordinary uh, to work with. Um, I I felt incredibly lucky. Hmm. Uh, to be suddenly there on the set with these extraordinary people and um, uh, very anxious uh, at first but um, you know once you settle into doing the work uh, because there are cons consummate professionals it you get um, you get on with the work and um, uh, and it was all you know, the shooting itself was all quite straightforward it, it just everything took so long to get there because uh availability of the actors and the scripts weren't ready money wasn't ready pandemic uh, uh illnesses it, it was everything that you could think of that could delay us delayed us and i just thought this uh, it, was, it was sheer willpower that got that film made um i just thought we'd never we'd never we'd never i knew we were going to make it i just, <laughs> I just didn't know when yeah. yes oh, and in which lifetime <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you see or when you have uh, actors who have quite the resume that that they do, when you go into a film, how much say do they have in their character development? And how much is it? Listen, I'm the director. This is what I think the film should look like. Well, I mean, one of the nice things about the about uh, my experience of film is that it's a collaborative experience. Hmm. I don't dictate. Um and um, uh, directing is a is is a kind of um, is a soft shoe shuffle, really. You you know you don't you don't go around shouting at people and telling them what to do. You make us you make a, you make a, situations in which they feel comfortable to do, you know, to work. And then and then the, by the time you get to the set, you both know what you're aiming for. And the actor might say, you know, is that working? Or you might say, that's not quite working. Uh, we'll we'll try it again. Or you might say something more specific, like, uh, I mean, it can be a very technical thing. Raise your voice, lower your voice, speak more slowly. Mm. Um, and, and some actors don't like to be talked to like that. And a lot of actors do. They're like simple technical 
the things, because that often is the issue. You can have a long intellectual conversation about the character on the set, if you've time, and, uh, and that could be interesting, but quite often it goes around in circles. You know, you, you really should know the character pretty clearly before you, you set the foot on the set. And the actor would feel, well, the actor would feel very, very discombobulated if they didn't know where they were going with the character. Um, so yeah. really the simple answer is that a little bit, a little push here, a little push there. And, uh, but you're all in this together. And um, mm. a lot of the time there isn't actually much conversation going on um, when to set it up. What I like to do and with actors is to make sure that they know the designer, they know the cameraman, they they know what they've done, and then they're out, they're on the set, and they you know there's the wallpaper, and there's the chair, and and there's the this, and there's the that, and some actors are not interested, and some actors very much are. Our actors mm -hmm. are very interested in that, in particular Kathy Bates, who her home with her family was very important to her, so she would go around that set, you know, poking her nose into everything, and uh, mm. she was covering all kinds of things that the designer had done. Or put on the set, and she would say, "Oh, look, this is really interesting." And and uh, so that'll be her way in. Uh, and um, and then I might be watching her, and I'd say, "Well, we can start the scene with that if you want. We don't have to start it here. We can start it there if you like that." And um, and that kind of thing, I think, is a a way of building a relationship as well as you know, telling the story, because that's all it's all about telling the story. So you know, you might say, "Well." That's good for the story. That idea. Let's let's see if we can elaborate that. Um, in your words, in a quick synopsis, what is the story of the Miracle Club? The story it has a very simple strap line, which is what got me interested in the first place. A bunch of working class women from Dublin go to Lourdes looking for a miracle, and I just thought that is a brilliant, brilliant idea, and uh, I hope I can get to make that film. Uh, so the women. Uh, they, they managed to, uh, with great difficulty, extract themselves from their homes and they go on the road. It's a sort of a road movie. They get to Lourdes and when they get there, they may never going for a miracle because that's what Lourdes is supposed to be about. But they're, they're, they're going for, nobody goes to Lourdes without wishing for something, uh, mm -hmm. even if the most simple spiritual uh, experience. And uh, that's what Lourdes offers. Because uh, there was something we talked about a lot when we were writing, is uh, the Lourdes effect. And uh, the Lourdes effect, for us anyway, was when people go there and they have this unexpected um, relationship with this place where they look around them and they see all these people who are perhaps very ill, disabled, uh, and they're all there for uh, some spiritual uh, reason. And um, that sense of... Uh, spirit of the spirit takes over i think a lot of people who are not interested in that particularly and quite surprised themselves anyway that's what happens to our ladies they get there and they feel uh, you know you go to lures and something's got to happen uh, and it forces them uh, if you like into facing themselves the laurel any character says you know you must you, you know she drops the bomb <laughs> but they they know uh, they can't walk away from it now they're trapped because if they go home this is not discussed, but I hope it's sort of you kind of sense it. You know, if they if they go home and li and walk away from all of this, they are they'll hate themselves and uh, mm. they'll feel more guilty than they ever did, which is the problem that they feel very guilty about the past and the things that they've done or not done. So they face up to it, and that's what Lourdes uh, becomes for people. Is it easier or difficult when it comes to doing period pieces and? Uh, as a director, making sure that things are to the certain time that you are filming a movie. I like to do period films, though they're more expensive and more difficult. Um, and uh, this was a period uh, that I was uh, very close to my my heart because I left Ireland in the mid sixties, and yeah. uh, when I set it, and it tell, and that was one of the reasons I set it. Then was because I felt that. It was something I could I could talk about, I'd know about, and feel comfortable telling the actors. Because the actors would, uh, <laughs> Kathy Bates said to me, one, uh, uh, Maggie Smith said to me one day, uh, I, I want to talk to, um, I need an advisor, don't we, on the set about religion, Catholicism, and all the, all the processes. And I said, you're looking at them. You know, ask me any question you like. <laughs> and uh, 
they were, and so, you know, it was making, making them feel comfortable that they were in this uh, slightly alien world and uh, that they could, uh, they were working with somebody who was able to say that's right and that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's not about directing that's just about giving advice yeah speaking of advice and faith how important has your faith been to you as you've navigated the tv and film industry well i had a lot of faith when i was very young and i uh, um uh, we i was brought up a very strict uh, catholic and um but you know that uh, life has changed and i've moved on i think when i went to london um I was just so wouldn't it's just such, such a need to get away that in a sense I dropped everything really. Mm. Uh, I left everything behind me. And um I mean I do I went home, I didn't fall out with my parents or anything. Um but uh Ireland was a like a just uh I was I was so busy making distance. Uh I didn't uh, I didn't really take into consideration my spiritual life at all. Um and you know, as you get older. Your spiritual life is uh, um, acknowledged, or or rather manifest through your love for your your family, your your wife, your children, or whatever. That's I think about as close I get to um, the spiritual experience these days. But that's important to me. And uh, the more you get older, you get the more you think about it, and um, the more spiritual you feel, hmm. and the more you can get out of life. And that's 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 a spiritual experience in itself. Just waking up every day thinking um, when you hear about a, a colleague or a friend who's, who's very, very ill or has died, mm. uh, you're thinking how lucky you are and how and how important it is to take advantage of the next moment and not to waste it. Uh, so that's... Mm. Uh, you talk about uh, getting things out of life and, and the experiences when we go to the film when we sit down to watch it, when we have our popcorn and our pop ready, what do you hope as a director that us watching it will get out of the film? Uh, well, I was talking about lurids and what people get uh, get going there. there. And, and I think that um, uh, it's not to say that Lourdes has done this, uh, but uh, I'm saying that uh, the people have done this to themselves, the characters hmm. have done this to themselves. But uh, Lourdes demands that uh, you feel something. And uh, and I think when the women got there, they demanded that they they felt that 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 it, this should be a catharsis. Maybe that's a bit strong, but that this should be an event in their lives. It's not to go wasted, and because uh, they're old, some of them, and uh, when they go home, they might not get back. The Maggie Smith character says, "You know, it's my yeah. own." So 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 they decide to face it, uh, and um, I think what they face is the past and their guilt, and I think. Uh, what they talk about is what they do is uh, reconcile themselves, and I think what they they experience is hope. Um, and um, I think the baths at the end are very important for me in that respect because it's like a baptism mm -hmm. and uh, a cleansing. And um, uh, and it's but it it's not the baths that does it. They they do it. Uh, they she says she's sorry before she gets in the bath, and she tells her the story. Of the of the past, at last she tells you the truth, which is mm. a confession. Before she gets in the bath, so the bath is like absolution and um, and uh, a cleansing. Our podcast is called Why Me Project, and so we always like to ask our guests about any Why Me moments that they have had in their life. Uh, people can ask Why Me in a valley when things aren't going well, or when things are going great, and they're just surprised that this is happening to them and they say why me have you had any why me moments that you can share with us today well i guess the extended one is uh meeting my wife uh and mm -hmm. um, being in love for uh so long with the with the, with the same woman and having children how many years uh 32 years nice. um, and that's my third wife uh, so I knew what I was after, and yeah. uh, by that time I was uh, um, absolutely certain uh, I wasn't going to make uh, certain mistakes. And um, uh, looking back, uh, I, in this instance, I did not. And uh, so hardly a day goes by where I don't uh, just think how wonderful it is uh, to mm. be with you. And um, 
So there's that. And uh, and I think sitting on the set with those three actors, I think that was a YMP move. <laughs> it would be for me too. <laughs> yeah, fair. <laughs> I think the yeah. first day on the set, uh, well, the first day on the set was terrifying. Probably um, two or three days on when we got into a kind of a rhythm. And uh, I probably felt very much like I did when I was doing my first short, which is, God, this is for me. I really, I'm really enjoying this. Mm. Yeah. I love that. Even that you've been doing this for so long and yet here you are getting ready to start a movie, The Miracle Club, and you still felt moments of like, oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, <laughs> All the nerves. <laughs> exactly. And that's how lucky I am uh, to be able to work on the same, like you were saying about, you know, radio, uh, to, to, uh, to do what it is that you like to do for most of your life. Yeah. The most fantastic privilege. Yeah, I'm into that. Uh, the Miracle Club in theaters, July the 14th. Mark that down on your calendar. Uh, Thaddeus, my friend, we are so appreciative of you taking some time from your busy schedule and hanging out with us today. Great. It's been a pleasure. Well, if you enjoyed what you heard today, like, subscribe, and check out more of our YouTube videos. Don't forget to follow us on all the socials, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and faithstrongtoday.com.